Good morning, everyone. My name is Matt Gregori. I manage the customer solutions RD and team at SoCal Gas. I want to thank you all for joining us today for the first SoCal Gas RD and research webinar featuring Opus 12. We hope that this is the first of a regular series of webinars where the RD and team will be able to share the results of our research projects with key stakeholders in the energy research community, as well as the general public. I wanted, before we begin, I wanted to give a little bit of information about the SoCal Gas rd and program. Uh, SoCal Gas is taking proactive steps to become one of the cleanest gas utilities in North America. The SoCal Gas Re Research Development and Demonstration Program, or rd and for short, plays a key role in this effort. We're staffed with experts in science, engineering, energy systems, industrial process technology, and environmental policy, and our program develops new products and technologies that can reduce customer cost, save energy, increase safety and reliability, improve air quality, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The rd and program supports research across the entire natural gas supply chain. As you can see here on the supply side, the Low Carbon Resources Program develops technical solutions that facilitate increasing and expanding the production of renewable natural gas and low-cost, low-carbon hydrogen to replace conventionally sourced gas. The Gas Operations Program focuses on supporting gas transmission, distribution, and storage operations. Research includes the areas of system design, material science, asset inspection, system monitoring, and risk mitigation technologies. And at the end of the supply chain, the customer solutions team develops technologies for all of our customers using natural gas to power their homes and businesses. This team addresses technology development for clean transportation, clean power generation, and customer end use applications. SoCal Gas rd and subject matter experts collaborate closely with universities, research organizations, businesses, national laboratories, public agencies, and our customers to move important new technologies from the lab to the marketplace. The rd and team coordinates with researchers across the state and the nation, supplementing and complementing the work of other public agencies such as the California Energy Commission and the Department of Energy. In 2019, the rd and program invested more than $13 million in energy technology projects designed to improve safety, reliability, efficiency, energy choice, and resiliency for our customers and energy customers throughout California. On average, every dollar provided by the SoCal Gas rd and program was matched by $5 of external funding support. For more information on the rd and program and a comprehensive list of projects, I invite you to download a copy of our 2019 annual report. And now a word on diversity. Pursuant to the California Public Utility Commission's Environmental and Social Justice Action Plan and General Order 156, SoCal Gas rd and is dedicated to improving the quality of life for all of our customers maintaining a diverse workforce, and working with suppliers that represent and reflect the communities we, re we serve. This webinar is just one of the ways we are working to engage and educate the public about the rd and program. I encourage you all to stay connected with the rd and team. Please visit our website for information on future webinars. You can download our annual report and feel free to email the team at rddinfo at socalgas.com. We look forward to your input, comments, and research suggestions. And then before we begin with the real content of today's webinar, just a few housekeeping items. There will be time for Q&A after the presentation. During the presentation, you may submit questions in the GoToMeeting questions box. And after the presentation, please raise your hand. If you'd like to ask a question, we will unmute you. Finally, a recording will be available to all attendees after the webinar. And now I would like to introduce Ron Kent. Ron leads our low carbon resources rd and team.
Okay. Sorry, I had a little bit of trouble with the buttons here. Uh, so thank you very much, Matt, and good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. So this is Ron Kent. Uh, I lead the uh, SoCal Gas's Low Carbon Resources Group. Uh, Matt, you could score the slide. Uh, so our vision is to be the cleanest gas utility in North America, delivering affordable, reliable, and increasingly renewable energy to our customers. And that's the focus of the Low Carbon Resources uh, Group. Next slide. So we have a big uh, task in front of us as we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Our, the, the CO2 that comes from you know, our company use plus all the gas that we distribute to, the, uh, to our customers amounts to about 40 million metric tons per year. That's a big challenge. So our goal is to start chipping away at that and reduce it uh, to zero as quickly as we can. Uh, just to give you uh, examples, uh, one or about 18 or 19,000 uh, cubic feet of natural gas is about one metric ton of CO2. So in global emissions, CO2 emissions are around 40 gigatons per year. So just I'm providing that to give you some perspective. Next slide, please. So Opus 12 uh, is of interest to us because uh, it has the ability to uh, take water and electricity and CO2 and make hydrocarbons, uh, particularly make uh, natural gas. So we can actually make synthetic natural gas from uh, wind and solar electricity, for example, uh, out of CO2 that we can capture from the air. Next slide. So you can hear a lot about electrochemical CO2 capture and conversion today. Uh, this is an innovative technology that essentially has no moving part. It's, it just uses uh, electricity and membranes uh, and electrodes uh, to uh, convert the CO2 and water into value added uh, chemicals. It's important because it has the uh, a real potential to minimize the need for large complex components you know, that we typically use in chemical engineering and chemical plants uh, to process uh, CO2, for example, to do methanation. For example, usually, usually those are very large, very hot systems uh, and uh, and so uh, electrochemical processing uh, gives us a different way of doing that. It can be small, compact, it can be distributed. And we can, again, use a similar uh, technology to make a variety of different chemicals from CO2, as you can see here in the illustration. So with that uh, introduction, I think it's time for Otasha. Uh, let me just say that, uh, you know, Opus 12 is a really a hard science uh, company located in the heart of Silicon Valley. It has a culture of rapid iteration, disruptive innovation, and bold, bold vision. Uh, it's one of six uh, energy, clean energy startups uh, to be incubated in the first cohort of the Silicon uh, cycle con road uh, program at Lawrence Berkeley lab. So I think the next slide is Otasha's. Okay, thanks, Ron. Really appreciate that uh, introduction. I didn't know that picture was out there on the web of me. It was a great picture that you found. Um, and really excited to be 
part of the very first uh, seminar and look forward to um, seeing this take off and growing um, as there's more companies that can show off their work. So I'm going to give an overview of Opus 12, uh, kind of um, you know how we started as a company and then go into um, how we think about scaling up and our technology and then some of the applications and uses of our technology um, to give an overview of how Opus 12 is uh, developing our systems. So at Opus 12, um, we really see CO2 emissions in a different way. We see them as, um, as, a, as a way to create a multi-billion dollar industry where we can take CO2 and using our uh, scalable systems to transform those emissions into common household products. And I'll talk more about that in later slides. Uh, before I get into that, I wanna talk a little bit about the background of Opus 12. So I'm one of three co-founders that started um, Opus 12. And the really beginnings of our, our uh, technology was started at, at Stanford where Kendra and myself, we were in a PhD program where we looked at metal catalysts that could convert carbon dioxide into one of 16 new molecules. And we were doing very much basic science where we were understanding on a, a quantum mechanics level of how these metals work and how we can engineer them to be better at that reaction. And then toward the end of my PhD, when Kendra was doing a postdoc at Slack, we got together and you know, realized that this is, could be a very powerful technology. These molecules that we can make out of CO2 already exist in industry, already represent uh, multi-billion dollar industries. And you know, what if we could scale up this technology and start to think about how do you build reactors and make it such that we can have systems that can um, house the catalyst that we had been studying um, to transform this reaction um, into an industrial product. And so uh, we started working together on that mission and then we met up with Nicholas Flanders who was in the business school and he had previous startup experience. He also worked at McKinsey in their clean tech practice. So he was used to thinking about kind of large scale systems and being strategic with uh, launching clean tech products. And he also of course really shared in our passion um, for utilizing CO2 waste. So the three of us uh, formed the founding team. And as Ron mentioned, we um, got our first really big break by getting into the Cyclotron Road program at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, where we were housed for the first three years of the company and uh, started to test our ideas, show that we can make um, an early stage prototype and, and test out proof of concepts. And uh, from there, we were able to build um, a company and spin out of the lab. So a little bit about our technology is that, you know, it, it really is pretty straightforward. It's a single reactor that takes CO2, water, and electricity. And then within that reactor houses the, the metal catalyst and environment for that, that catalyst to function optimally. And then what we output is um, these molecules that are basically fuels and chemicals. And then we also produce oxygen as a byproduct. And specifically what those molecules are that we're focused on as a company is uh, carbon monoxide, uh, ethylene, and methane. Um, and many times you hear about um, certainly carbon monoxide as a molecule that you do not want in your home. But it turns out that carbon monoxide is actually very useful industrial compound. Um, and it can be, it's oftentimes used and almost exclusively used to make other products. And so um, here we're showing an example of how you can take this building block of carbon monoxide and make different polymers and products all the way from small household products such as your iPhone and even luggage and um, appliances in your home um, to then paint and other um, materials and, and products that you use to uh, make buildings and, and create the world around you. And then also at the largest scale, you can use carbon monoxide to make fuel. So you can make jet fuel and diesel fuel. And there you'd be displacing the petroleum version of these, these fuels with a 
with um, a, a fuel that's effectively equivalent to what you can produce in a petroleum setting. Same goes for ethylene, that it can be used to make a wide array of different products, uh, mostly in the, in the polymer space, so you're making different types of plastics that you currently make from petroleum. You can make them from ethylene that we can make in this single step reactor. This one box goes from CO2 to ethylene, and then you would process that ethylene further to make the other products. And for methane, even though the uses of methane aren't as diverse, but it still represents a really huge market. And what we're focused on is this biogas market where biogas comes from uh, farming and uh, municipal waste where you're digesting the organic compounds. And then in the biogas stream, you end up with, can be up to 50% carbon dioxide. And um, historically, and at the moment, that CO2 is separated and then vented, and then the, the methane goes into the pipeline and used as um, a, a synthetic natural gas or renewable natural gas. Um, we see a world in which we can take that CO2 um, and have, have this biogas run through our system, convert that CO2 to more methane and, and effectively doubling the yield of, of the biogas that then goes into the pipeline. And so now you've uh, reduced your CO2 emissions inherently at the source, and you've made methane that's produced from a biogenic um, source as opposed to um, digging it out, out of the ground and creating a net amount of CO2. And in, in general, when we think about making these molecules, we not only think about the end use of the, their products, but also, again, the CO2 impact. Um, and we realize that when we make a ton of these molecules, we, we not only are sequestering CO2 directly to make that molecule. So for example, making ethylene, you can see here on the left, that for one ton of ethylene, you're really sequestering about three tons of CO2. And then you also avoid CO2 emissions compared to the conventional way of making these molecules. Um, so you know, as we're building a company, we certainly think about our CO2 impact and how we can, you know, as we scale up, utilize more and more CO2 emissions in different um, industries and making different products. Now to talk a little bit more about our technology, our core innovation is this membrane electrode assembly shown here. Um, this membrane electrode assembly houses those metal catalysts that uh, we make um, in-house and we can put them in an environment in which they can be optimized um, and we can optimize the reaction conditions around them. And that membrane electrode assembly goes into existing electrolyzers that are already built at scale. So you can see in the background, um, you have these uh, ele PIM electrolyzers that are already built at large scale. That, that size in the background is about the size of a shipping container. And we are a drop-in component to these existing reactors. And the analogy we like to use with our system is that we basically are like the the chip that's inside your laptop, similar to Intel. So Intel makes the CPU, which is the heart and soul of the, the laptop, is the thinking part of the main chip. And that goes into a laptop built by another manufacturer. We're uh, in the same way where that we built the chip, the main part of the system, and that goes into um, these reactors that are already built at scale by another manufacturer. Um, and so this allows us to really uh, grow the technology, focus on our core part of it, the, our core expertise, and be able to scale really quickly. Now, when we were first starting the company, we looked at, um, you know, we had this idea of creating these membranes, but we looked at kind of what type of reactor would we like to input our system, our membranes into. And what we realized was that um, we thought that the PIM electrolyzer, which PIM stands for proton electron, uh, proton exchange membrane, and these PIM electrolyzers, uh, we found, had a lot of advantages. Um, and up to that moment, um, no one had created a PIM CO2 electrolyzers. There were PIM water electrolyzers that were already at scale, but not a PIM CO2 electrolyzer. And the, the advantages we saw were, were shown here were that um, these, these PIM electrolyzers had already been around for decades, so they were already highly developed and coming down the cost curve. They had really fast ramp times, which means that you can shut them on and off really quickly within a matter of seconds. 
And so you can directly couple them to um, renewable electricity, such as wind turbines, which just have an intermittency, as well as solar, which has an intermittency. Um, again, because they've been developed for so, such a long time, the CapEx was, was, was coming down the cost curve and, and still continues to do so. They're modular, so you can have um, a, a core stack, a core unit, and add more of those units to meet the needs of a specific customer. They also have a very high current density, which means a very high production rate. So you can put a large amount of CO2 in and, and convert that uh, within a small footprint. And they also have operational simplicity. So they are a single box. You can put them on site. They operate autonomously. Um, and, and they've been out in the field and have shown that um, they're very robust systems. So we set out to do that. And uh, what we soon realized is that you know, even though we're still a drop-in component, there's still many aspects of creating um, this technology. And just really want to highlight those here is that, um, you know, there's these seven categories in which we really have to optimize and think about and build a team around and, and bring in some in-house expertise. Because, um, you know, initially we had just our catalyst layer, um, which we had gained the early knowledge of from our PhD. But, but now we were trying to think about how do you create a catalyst layer that can have a high production rate that can go within these systems. And then once you have the catalyst layer, you have to think about how do you create that membrane electrode assembly, which houses the catalyst and optimizes the environment. And then the MEA has to go into a stack because you stack these electrodes on top of each other and create a whole stack. And so you have to think again about um, you know, mass transport and how do you optimize the CO2 going in and the products coming out. You then put um, that stack into an entire system where you have you know, water coming in and you have CO2 going in and, and coming out and, and how do you think about the reaction conditions around that, that stack. Um, and then we had to build out an infrastructure to, to run all of these tests. We had to look at monitoring and characterization um, and using design for experiment to optimize each one of these um, components. And then uh, working with our manufacturing partner to put into a full electrolyzer uh, we did have to make some modifications to the to the electrolyzers themselves in order to house our our membrane, and so we worked with our manufacturing partner to do so. And then lastly, um, we realized that for certain customers and for certain um, materials that we make, uh, polymers, for example, you do need a purified stream of our our in products. So carbon monoxide, you would need greater than 99% purity, and so we worked with a partner to um, create a purification system that can produce that high purity of carbon monoxide. Um, so all of these different components had to be optimized to create a single system, uh, which we have recently done. Um, and um, one thing that we realized early on is that you know, in, in optimizing all these systems, we could leverage existing personnel and existing people who have developed electrochemical systems in analogous fields. And so we've been really um, aggressive about working with other partners. And so, you know, I mentioned we have a manufacturing partner that has decades of experience and has a manufacturing floor that we can leverage to build our systems. We also work with the national labs. So we, we got started out at Berkeley Lab and we still uh, interact with Berkeley scientists to do material characterization and also leverage their expertise in PIM-based systems. Uh, we've started working with NREL, um, uh, both on the electrochemical side and through their ChemCat bio program, where um, they've sent us catalysts that we've tested. They also have um, PIM expertise as well at, at, at Inroad that we've been able to, to uh, leverage and, and work with as a partnership. Lawrence Livermore, we've worked with them in catalyst development and tested um, some of their catalysts in our system to see how they perform. And then we were able to work with um, Membrane Technology and Research, which um, is a Bay Area company that uh, has expertise in gas purification. So we work with them to commission our gas purification system. And just one bit of an aside for any uh, national lab members who are here, um, you know, we are still very much looking to work with national labs. And so there is a call called the ACT3 for uh, CO2 capture and utilization and storage. Um, the proposal is due in November and we would uh, love to work with anyone who uh, is thinking about doing a CCUS project and wants to uh, work with us as a subcontractor. So just a shameless plug there for uh, anyone to reach out. Um, so going back to our, our system, so 
you know, we, we combine all these different aspects to create our first, a very first system last year. Um, our, our first system was about the size of a dishwasher and it could do kilograms of CO2 conversion per day. And we actually use that system to make products which we haven't publicized yet because we're still working with our partners, but we were able to make um, kind of household components um, and, and, and it, a component that was basically indistinguishable from the existing part for um, a handful of manufacturers. And so that's, that was really exciting to be able to use our system to make something out of CO2. And currently we're scaling up to these larger sizes. So number two is about the size of an industrial refrigerator. Number three, about the size of a shipping container. And number four is a uh, building size. And you can, of course, add more of these in modules to, to meet the different needs of, of your CO2 emissions. Um, and what's really exciting about um, this array of system is that um, numbers two through four, um, our, our manufacturing partners is shifting to a model where there's gonna be one electrode size that fits all three of them. And so um, that will, again, just help really bring down cost. Uh, we can manufacture a single size electrode and meet the needs of these different customers at different scales and not have to uh, build a diverse group of electrodes. And so we're in the process of scaling up to that larger size. And again, doing a whole re-optimization of the membrane electrode assembly, the, the recipes, the reaction conditions, the mass transport, all of these are re-optimized um, at, at these larger size electrodes. But what's great is that once we're there, that um, we can very quickly and rapidly go to larger building size systems, uh, which we look forward to. And to give you a sense of the vision of how some of these systems would integrate in with um, and within the market. Um, so here, this is an actual uh, polymer manufacturing plan in Europe. And we have a, a rendering here showing our system in a shipping container, so that's size number three, that would be housed at this polymer manufacturer where you would literally pipe in CO2 emissions that already exist on site here into our system. And they would be converted into uh, carbon monoxide uh, in this case which would just go into the existing pipes for carbon monoxide and be made into polymers. Um, and we've already started engaging with um, both manufacturers of this type and end users that would eventually be buying the polymers and using those products. And so I wanna give you uh, some additional examples of what that would look like. So one way in which we could make these sort of CO2 negative polymers uh, would be in uh, common household products. So here is a, a representative shoe, and within the shoe, we can make um, EVA out of ethylene, we can make uh, the polyurethane out of carbon monoxide, and basically create um, the equivalent materials of what these companies are already using, but make them out of, um, out of CO2 and create um, a CO2 negative footprint. And even beyond just sort of shoes and common household products, we can you know, make everything from reusable bottles to luggage to uh, materials that are in buildings um, and even to, to jet fuel. And in fact, we have a contract with um, the US Air Force where um, uh, we are working, we're supporting basically our R&D work to make jet fuel out of CO2. And in this case, the US Air Force realizes that you know, you can uh, capture CO2 from anywhere in the world by using direct air capture. Um, you can run that through our system to make carbon monoxide and then right away run it through a system called Fisher Tropes to make uh, jet fuel. And so, you know, instead of having these fuel convoys, which are often uh, have a high number of casualties to, to bring fuel to a specific location, they can just make it on site. So um, we've been starting that partnership with with the US Air Force. We've also been working with um, other companies in the biochemical space. So um, there are microbes that can digest syngas. There's also microbes that can digest methane and we can produce that on site with our system. Um, and one of these partnerships we already have is through, with Lancetech where um, they can take that syngas, their microbes digested to make ethanol or other carbon products and then they can also um, take that ethanol and make jet fuel from that as well. Um, so we're um, working with them as part of a, a DOE grant and showing that, 
that process can uh, work end to end. We also, um, you know, as we think about scaling up our system, um, we are looking for kind of larger deployment opportunities. So once we have this uh, megawatt scale, the shipping container size system, uh, we'd want to deploy it um, where you know we can capture renewable electricity when the demand is low, use that electricity to convert CO2 and make these other products. Um, and SoCal Gas has committed to uh, support us um, in that effort as we, we scale up so that we can take CO2 emissions um, from say an SMR unit that's making hydrogen and um, create more CO2 negative products that can uh, basically reduce the carbon footprint of the hydrogen as well as uh, reduce CO2 emissions overall. Uh, so that's something that we have um, in the pipeline and are excited about getting that started over the next couple of years. And one just really cool example is that, you know, in the far, far future, um, you know, we, we've received grants from NASA to make uh, products out of CO2. It just so happens that on Mars, 95% of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. Um, there's also CO2 um, that they found on the moon. And so we can make um, the rocket fuel of choice, which is methane. And then we can also make um, ethylene to make polymers and make kind of a whole array of products for future space travel. Um, so we, we would love to see an Opus 12 system someday uh, within space. So I um, just want to end with acknowledging support that we've gotten from various sources. So we have uh, several major uh, uh, investors um, who basically support deep tech. So DCVC and Breakout Ventures support deep tech entrepreneurship. Uh, we, we work with Evoke, which represents the Canadian oil and gas companies, which have a, a huge mandate to reduce their CO2 emissions. And then the Dolby family, um, which supports uh, deep tech and, um, in, in sort of in, in CO2 emissions reduction. We've gotten several uh, federal and state grants, all the way from the Department of Energy and NASA, uh, Natural Science Foundation, RPE, and then the Air Force, as well as California um, grants to the CEC. And then uh, we've worked with several partners. Uh, additional SoCal Gas, PG&E has also supported us um, in, in the same projects. And then uh, several incubators, uh, Cyclotron Road, as was mentioned earlier, has been an uh, early supporter of ours. And along those lines, I want to acknowledge um, there was a recent press release, which kind of kicked this uh, webinar off, uh, where we announced the latest um, support that uh, SoCal Gas, as well as PG&E, uh, gave to uh, develop our system for biogas um, to, again, upgrade the CO2 and biogas. Um, yeah. And lastly, um, just want to leave with um, our kind of uh, calculations that we did to compare ourselves to trees and that um, we can put the CO2 conversion power of about 37,000 trees in um, an electrode stack that's about the size of a checked-in suitcase. So um, we're really uh, excited about bringing these really power dense, um, you know, technology that can basically do the work of, of trees and converting CO2 into something useful. And with that, I believe we will start to take questions. Yes, thanks, Tasha. That was that was great. Um, and. Um, we do have one question from the audience, and before I get to that, it I, it does look like we're maybe having a technical difficulty where anybody who dialed in from the web is may not be able to uh, be unmuted to ask a question, so I would encourage you to submit your questions. Uh, you can type them into the questions box, um, and then I will relay them on and we can discuss them. Uh, but we did get a question during the presentation. How does the Opus 12 technology differ from Halder Topso's bio SNG process that uses a boiling water reactor? Is it more efficient? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Halder Topso uses a solid oxide electrolyzer. And with a solid oxide electrolyzer, you do go to really high temperatures um, and you um, basically use this ceramic electrolyte to transport ions and 
um, kind of create um, an, an electrolyzer system. Um, the advantages we see with our system over the hollow top so is that one, be because hollow top so is a high temperature, you know, up, up to like 500 degrees C, somewhere around there, and, and we are uh, pretty close to rim temperature. Um, the advantage that temperature different gives is that we can we can shut on and off very intermittently within seconds. And so when you're coupling to renewable electricity, that's really key to be able to shut on and off very quickly. When you're at high temperatures, just the, the thermal um, weight, the thermal load on like materials gets really tough to to shut on and off uh, very quickly. Um, and so it, it's also um, those systems tend to be hard to scale down to something that's like the size of a dishwasher as our, our first system. And so, uh, you know, how to top those first system, I believe is, is something that's equivalent to like our, our shipping container size system um, that, that we'd be building in the next couple of years. So that's like the smallest that they could um, kind of scale down to just because, in, in part because of the, the sort of high temperatures and the material properties that are associated with uh, solid oxide electrolyzers. Um, in terms of efficiency, um, I, I haven't seen their number specifically to know how they compare. I mean, the thing is they do uh, have to generate heat. And so, you know, it could very well be that in certain situations where maybe you have just um, a ton of waste heat and can um, utilize that, um, there, there could be some um, efficiency advantages. Um, our system doesn't have that uh, waste heat requirement, so we can be much more robust. We can um, easily be indoors. Um, we can be more autonomous. Um, we don't have to have an operator there to, to again, manage the thermal load. Um, so there's, there's um, an array of advantages that we see with our system. Great. Um, and now, uh, can you comment at all on the energy efficiency of the process or the life performance of the reactor? Yeah, so we, um, you know, we're, we're going to drop in component to um, water electrolyzers. And so we benchmark a lot of our, our target performances against water electrolyzers. Um, so, you know, Water electrolyzers um, are already operating at 50,000 hours um, in terms of lifetime, and that's um, our target. When we think about um, putting a system out there and, and uh, having a warranty with it, we think about a 50,000 hour um, plus lifetime. Um, electrolyzers are water electrolyzers also have really high current density, so you know we're being a bit more modest, and and at least for our first sort of set of several generations of the system is saying that, you know, we'll be, you know, we're talking one amp per centimeter square, whereas electrolyzers actually are, are two amps uh, per centimeter squared plus. And this is, this is again, an advantage of like PEM electrolyzers where you can really get these high current densities. It means a high production rate um, as opposed to, um, to other systems that have, um, can sometimes have trouble getting to these high current densities. Um, and then for voltage efficiency, we we're again talking that um, 55% range, but there's no reason we couldn't go up to 60 to 80 percent. And then again, for selectivity, we, our target is over 90 percent. Um, and so because we're we're dropping components of the existing reactors, there's we don't see any reason why we couldn't meet these targets. And uh, we're certainly on track to have that, um, have those be our, our performance metrics as we scale up our system. Yeah, it's, I think it's interesting. I think I think this is a great slide because I know when I first started learning about coelectrolysis and this technology is, it's a much broader question than strict uh, conversion efficiency, right? You also have to take into consideration selectivity. Uh, you know how much of the energy you're putting in goes to the product that you want, uh, and current density. There's there, there's a there's sort of a matrix of um, metrics that you want to you want to track here yeah and and there is um a trade-off between operational expenditures and capex so you know if you know we can make our systems perform at a higher current density and that would reduce the capital expenditure but then you might um, trade off your voltage efficiency so then you're putting in more energy uh as you operate it um so 
you know, there are some knobs that we can turn and, and, and trade offs that uh, we can do between CapEx and OpEx, depending on um, like, you know, what the customer's needs are. For our first market, um, we see that our performance is already suitable to be cost competitive um, in that, in those markets. So we, um, yeah, we're really, um, so yeah, it's just a matter of like getting better and better as we scale up. So a couple of questions on Catalyst. Uh, does your technology rely on precious metals and uh, life performance depends on the Catalyst? And your, is your Catalyst different from a PEM electrolyzer? Yeah, we, we do use different Catalysts than a PEM electrolyzer. Um, we use an array of transition metal Catalysts. Just depends on uh, the molecule that we're using. Um, I mean, the, the, the standard metals that are used for this um, technology, which is, you know, what we've published on in our PhD is a, is a mix of, uh, you know, silver and copper, uh, gold, zinc, um, uh, nickel. So it's, um, you know, some of those metals are more expensive than others, um, but, you know, they, we can, we can use them. And one of the things we look at is like bringing down the, the cost by um, reducing the amount of catalysts that we have to use, um, and and also looking at the the trade off of like um, using a, a maybe more higher performance catalyst that maybe is more expensive versus one that's um, slightly lower performance but less expensive. Um, and I can also say that the catalyst is not the number one cost for our system. Um, our, our system uh, first our, our kind of number one cost is electricity so we do rely on having low cost uh, renewable electricity and 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 you know as long as we continue to build a world in which renewable electricity is going to be the lowest cost electricity um, then we should be you know good in that area um, and then there's also um, the the catalyst costs even from a capex standpoint is not the number one cost in our system um, so ultimately we're using very small amounts of these metals to um, to make these these systems. Great. Um, has anyone from the traditional environmental advocates community uh, learned about the potential of your company? Uh, have you talked to any um, environmental and social justice groups? Um, about the potential for Opus 12 and carbon capture? Uh, we, we have on a, a high level, I mean, I, I, um, I would say, you know, going to sort of clean tech events, you, you um, run into, um, you know, an array of people in this space. Um, and so, you know, we definitely um, see ourselves as, as an alternative to producing, you know, some of the liquid fuels and components that we already use uh, in a way that's much cleaner. Um, and, you know, especially with, you know, fuels such as like diesel fuel, oftentimes they can have impurities in them that can um, get into the air and end up uh, affecting disadvantaged communities much more than, than uh, non-disadvantaged communities. And so, um, we we definitely see our technology playing a role in in like reducing particular matter from diesel fuel and um, kind of making the the air cleaner. Um, also, too, I mean, we we um, you know as a I mean, we're effectively manufacturing um, CO two emissions into a new molecule, and so we um, look to creating and putting our system in in um, kind of most likely more rural areas where these um, CO2 emissions are anyway. We can take those CO2 emissions and run it through our system. And so, you know, we're, we'd be creating jobs and then also, again, reducing emissions in uh, next to, you know, a, a chemical plant of some sort. So um, we definitely see our, our goals aligned um, with that. And we, um, as we start to deploy more, we, we want to be more strategic about um, seeing where we can be a benefit to uh, disadvantaged communities. Yeah, and and I hope that this webinar, uh, in and of itself, is 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 an opportunity to, for everyone attending to kind of share this with folks they know, 
um, you know, I think this is a really uh, interesting and compelling opportunity. I know, you know, when we talked about it internally, we like the idea of taking CO2 and converting it into durable goods. So you know where that carbon is for a very long time period, as opposed to, you know, traditional sequestration, which, um, you know, may have some challenges or, you know, you have to kind of keep track of where that CO2 is. If you put it into a plastic or a building material, um, we think that's a really exciting opportunity for CO2 reduction. Yeah, absolutely. Not only could you, you know, prevent that CO2 from going into the air, but you also could like displace new molecules being pulled up from the ground. And so, um, you know, you kind of have this like amplification effect. And while all still, I mean, keeping the economy going is not, this isn't something that's purely a cost. Um, it's something that can generate revenue and you, know, you can sell these polymers and sell these materials. Um, and so, um, you know, it really is cyclic in, you know, in, in, in both the economics and the materials as well of, of generating revenue out of, out of waste. So speaking of, of cost and revenue, uh, how does the cost of products made with your technology compared to uh, conventional products? And specifically, uh, can you talk a little bit about RNG produced with CO2 conversion compared with other RNG production methods? Yeah, so I mean, from, from the very beginning, we um, we kind of had the thesis that, that um, no one was going to pay more for uh, a green. There's not, there's not really a green premium. And so um, we um, look at our performance metrics and do our technical economic analysis, assuming that we have to be cost competitive with the conventional um, molecule. And so, um, you know, the, the biggest cost, again, for our system is, is electricity. And so, um, you know, we basically look at it, okay, what, you know, given like a, a fixed performance of our system, like what is the cost of electricity need to be to, to break even and be a cost parity with a conventional molecule? And we don't as generally assume that they're government incentives. Um, certainly government incentives will enhance that, that value, but um, we don't assume that it'll be the case. And, and so it, it sort of depends on the molecule, but generally, um, if we have electricity that's cheaper than six cents a kilowatt hour, um, we can be cost competitive at scale. Um, and then, you know, of course, if you, you know, there's renewable electrical PPAs that are going for one and a half cents per kilowatt hour in very select regions. It's, it's not necessarily ubiquitous, but, um, you know, we can, you know, be co-located next to, uh, you know, a wind turbine or, or hydro and, and get um, a PPA that's, PPA's power purchase agreement that is lower cost, then um, we can be competitive with um, with the existing uh, conventional technology. So, that's, so as we think about strategically going out in the roadmap, we would look at, you know, we would definitely look for places where there's low cost electricity, or think about, you know, um, you know, such as data center companies. They do this. They they actually go out and you know sponsor a solar field and then use a PPA to capture that electrical cost. So um, that's something that we, we, we're looking at as well as we think about, um, you know, scaling up our technology and leveraging the low cost renewable electricity. Great. Um, can you envision making polymers at the point of use, for example, a shoe factory rather than a large centralized chemical plant? Um, potentially. I mean, I think the... The thing is, like a lot of shoe manufacturers just purchase the polymers directly and then uh, like shape the polymer into the shoe. They typically don't make the polymers on site. And so um, I think the challenge there would be just um, convincing the end user to to become a polymer manufacturer, which I think they they probably would rather just have um, existing polymer manufacturers do that. Um, and we find that it, it it works pretty well because we can, you know, there's already this, uh, you know, polymer manufacturing plant that's built out at scale. You know, we can um, 
drop in our shipping container and satisfy the needs of that particular plant. And it just makes for much um, sort of streamlined and, and lower cost process as opposed to going to a, a end user and replicating all of the different pumps and everything that uh, needs to happen to, to make a polymer. Um, now we, we have um, for our early stage batch materials that we've made, you know, we've, um, we have a facility that does end-to-end -end <clears throat> CO2 to polymer um, you know, production. Um, so we we definitely know that it can be done and, and shown that it, it works. It's just, I think the, the at scale with an end user that's making a specific thing, um, it's unlikely they would wanna become a, a polymer manufacturer on the spot. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really interesting point. So uh, in addition to all of the science and optimizing your polymer and uh, or your your catalyst and developing your electrode membrane, you've had to learn a little bit about you know consumer good supply chains and how to integrate properly in these sort of vast uh, industrial supply chains that are already established. Yeah, and and you know we're we're doing that um, in a lot of ways to be able to start small and to um, kind of find a way to to support the company through revenue um, as we scale up to a larger system. This is one thing we've learned from watching the first sort of clean tech boom, where um, companies kind of went for the the big um, you know hundred million dollar plant installation and skipped over the smaller markets and then found that it was really difficult to have a, a first of a kind you know hundred million dollar plant um, like the financing was was really expensive and and also you know there's still um, at that point if it's a first of a kind it could be some technical risk um, that's still there and scaling it up and so what we've tried to do is um, you know build these smaller systems first um, take out some of the technical risk um, produce products that can bring revenue into the company and then like and we can leverage that revenue to then build these larger systems and we see that as a way of um, just creating a company that's a bit more sustainable um, as opposed to just leveraging um, you know venture dollars to try to get to the like the big the big system um, so I mean you know consumer products I, there's in terms of like CO2 impact probably is, is, is relatively small if you just look at the, the math of it. But in terms of like sustaining us as a company, um, it can have a really huge impact in, in bringing in revenue and, and doing, um, you know, just having the technical side of things de-risked before we build our first $100 million plant in, in a few years in the future. Great. Yeah, I think that was a, uh, you know, when I when when we first met years ago at a Rocket Fund, I think that was a, a compelling argument for your team was a very thoughtful go to market strategy that involved scaling and identifying niche parts of the market to address first. Um, you know, so I, I, I think that's a, a really good point. Um, we'll do one more technical question and I think we'll wrap up. And I'll, I'll give you an opportunity for some last words, but uh, can you envision converting CO2 to food like plants do? Yeah, um, so I mean, in that case, we would couple with a, a biochemical company um, similar to like Lanzatec, because Lanzatec microbes can take carbon monoxide and they also take hydrogen, uh, both of which we can make in our, our system. And they can make an array of higher carbon products well, you can imagine um, having a microbe that, um, you know, makes glucose or makes um, some other type of fundamental organic compound that we would eat and would ideally be delicious. Um, and in fact, there, you know, there's several synthetic biology companies that are making, um, you know, plant proteins and, and lab-based meats. And, um, you know, those microbes can start to ferment uh, do gas fermentation, so ferment carbon monoxide and hydrogen, then we can be a supplier to those companies. Um, and so, yeah, that's something we're really excited about as, as about being this back-end supplier to the emerging synthetic biology uh, economy that 
that um, I think will also be developed in parallel to our systems. Um, and so that that's a really exciting part of it. And also on Mars, right? I mean, you need food in space uh, more than, uh, in some ways, more than um, you would on on Earth. And so, um, you know, that could be a really compelling way to, to have um, space travel on, on Mars with making food from the atmosphere. So speaking speaking of Mars, we're we're out of time, but I would encourage everyone to listen to the Energy Gang podcast that featured you, Atasha. I thought it was a really interesting conversation about your uh, education and you know your initial aspirations, getting into science and everything like that. So I, I definitely recommend anybody on the call uh, to check that out. You can also check out Ron Kent's Energy Gang podcast too. Um, I'm the only one here who doesn't have an Energy Gang podcast yet. <laughs> That's a hint for anybody listening. Um, so uh, we've we've run out of time, Natasha. I just want to give you the the last word. Um, any any parting thoughts for uh, the folks attending? Yeah, absolutely. We're uh, yeah, just really happy to be here and share technology. And um, we also are happy to collaborate with um, not only national labs, but we've also collaborated with universities and other companies. And so. Um, definitely reach out if that's of interest, and um, we'd love to grow this technology together. Um, so thanks, everyone. Great. Well, thank you so much for the presentation and for joining us, and thanks for everyone for joining in on the webinar. Uh, remember to check out our website, and you can email the RD&D team at rddinfo at socalgas.com. Uh, have a great morning.